Yeah? Yeah. All right. All right, here we go. Everyone, um, Feihan Xu, I'm going to talk about asynchronous I.O. in Python 3. Uh, so uh, this talk basically all begins with uh, this PEP called 3156. Uh, the official title is Asynchronous I.O. Support Rebooted. Uh, basically, it, subs it describes a new event loop implementation. And um, one of its goals uh, is that it, it be compatible with the current existing event loops. So primarily Twisted, but also like Tornado, etc. cetera. Um, and right now, it's uh, slated to land in Python 3.4. So not the, not the current version. The current version is 3.3. And probably, you know, early 2014, hopefully in time for the Montreal PyCon. Oops. Uh, the big takeaway is that with, uh, you know, what Guido is working on right now, we should be able to write asynchronous code without threads or callbacks. And I should, you know, um, actually say a little here that uh, what Guido is doing is I, I don't feel it's like not invented here syndrome. It's not like he just wants to... It's not like he just doesn't like Twisted and he wants to make his own version. I think like the, the model he's going for is something that we're all sort of uh, trending towards in uh, the programming language world. For example, uh, we already see it in um, Node.js. They have this thing called Fibers, which is essentially the same idea. And, um, and I, I'm pretty sure Ruby people are probably looking at this and... You know, I'm, I'm not a Ruby person, but if, um, you know, if, if I was working on the railroad and one day was a huge accident and a huge iron spike went through my head and my personality totally changed and uh, I all of a sudden started liking Ruby, <laughs> if that happened and I was a Ruby guy, I would be like, oh, well, Node's doing it, Python's doing it, I guess we should do it too, just, you know, with some more monkey patching. <laughs> and <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's all, we're all moving in this direction. So it's, uh, it's a thing that we're probably going to run into, um, unless you're doing PHP, I guess. All right, so there's, a, there's been a huge debate that's raged for, I don't know, decades now about threads versus event loop. I'm not going to talk about it because uh, that's not the subject of my talk. And I think Twisted being around for so long kind of more or less justifies that the event loop is a, is a basically good idea. Um, you can, you know, follow this link here later uh, if you want to, you know, see more details about this particular discussion. So, but I am interested in uh, telling you about the differences between Twisted and Tulip. And I could just give you, like, a, a list or a spreadsheet or something, but instead I will use an insane analogy. So, um, when you're programming Twisted, actually, uh, raise your hand if you've done any programming with Twisted. Okay, so, I mean, some people will know exactly what I'm talking about. So when you're programming Twisted, it's kind of like being a mystical ninja warrior. Okay, and um, I need to make it clear that um, you're not like a run-of-the-mill ninja warrior. You're mystical, and there's, a, there's like a big difference. I think there's a certification you have to pass. <laughs> okay, so because you're not like, you know, taking on uh, random dudes, right? You're fighting demons and demigods. And the only way you can do that is if you, if you clone yourself. You have to make an army of shadow clones, right? Concurrency. And the thing is, like, uh, this is not easy. Like, you, there's like, a huge amount of mental gymnastics that you requires, and you have to train for years and years, and you might die. And also, we all know that ninja magic always comes with a terrible price. You don't just, like, wave a wand and something happens. You have to, you have to sacrifice something. In this case, the more clones you make, the more insane you become. Right, so like, like twisted people, like, you should, you should be nodding, right? This is exactly how it's like the working of twisted. It's kind of cool, but it's also insane. So on the other hand, if you're programming, um, you know, asynchronous code with Tulip, it's more like playing plants versus zombies. Okay, so if you're, if you're not familiar, it's a computer game, and what you do is you have to fight these zombies that want to uh, invade your home. And you, the only weapons you have are like these plants, and you just you just plant like a ton of plants, but you also have to manage them because a lot of plants have certain things, and you have to like click on them or something. So, uh, I mean, the game basically involves like dragging, and dropping, and tapping on things very quickly. Uh, I'm basically saying like it, it doesn't require any training; like you just pick it up, right? 
And also, uh, sometimes you end up playing for hours and hours without eating or sleeping because it's just that easy. Right? It's a casual game. Um, so, I mean, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to explain this analogy further. Um, I will make a confession, though. Like that, like that whole analogy part uh, it was like the meat of my talk. And like, you could probably leave and uh, you get the gist of it. The rest of the talk is just frosting. Um, but we all like frosting, right? So I'll just keep babbling. Okay, so uh, before I can really show you what Tulip is like, I think I need to revisit what, what sort of the state, current state of affairs is now. So here's an example of how we might fetch a web page and twist it. And this sample is a little bit longish, but if we go to the end there, that's the important part, right? Whoa, what is with all this flickering? I mean, it's connected. Okay, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Oh, it's not flickering anymore. That's good. Oh, pff, no, okay. Whatever. Um, so here, here's the, like, the important part, right? You create an agent object, then you call the request method on it. It doesn't return like a result right away. Instead, it returns a deferred. And then what you do is you add a chain of callbacks on the deferred for each stage of I.O. That, that you need to make in this program, okay? So after, oh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so, so after you, um, after, so the request method, the result of that is the, the headers, response object. So that gets fed to this callback, and that gets sent to print headers. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, we make another request for the request body, which gets handled by print body. After that's done, we head to this anonymous function, which stops the reactor and terminates the program. And it just goes like that. It's pretty easy to kind of see what's going on. Um, but the one thing I should note is that it seems like there's only three callbacks in this program. That's actually not true. There are five callbacks. Because if you look at the body of get response body, you have to do this sort of weird thing where you, um, if you want to get the body, you see this deliver body thing, you have to pass it a a body receiver object, which is a subclass of protocol, and like my head is already hurting right now. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's like five callbacks, because Twisted is all about callbacks. All right, so let's look at what it's like in Twisted. Or sorry, that, that's, okay, yeah, I, I didn't do this. I got sleepy, I went to bed. Um, okay, so you can see a little bit from the example um, some of the problems with asynchronous based code, or callback based in asynchronous code. One is that it can, it can be a little difficult to understand the control flow. Um, also, error messages tend not to be very friendly because the stack trace is going to contain a lot of stuff that contains code that you didn't write. Right? It's, going to take, it's going to contain a lot of the reactor code from Twisted. Also, debugging is a little bit harder for kind of the same reason. When you're in PDD, PDB, for instance, and you try to go up a frame, you're not going to go into something that you wrote. You're going to go into like reactor internals. All right, so here's the equivalent example in Tulip. You can see already it's, it's way shorter, right? Um, it's, it does pretty much exactly the same thing. Uh, there's really no callbacks unless you count the fact that here we call the download function once to get the coroutine, and then we execute, execute the coroutine. So maybe there's one callback, but like there's only one. Um, and you'll notice that we're doing this thing with yield from here, which uh, hopefully I'll explain adequately later. But yeah, it's simpler, right? But I'm trying to be a little fair here. So uh, Tulip does have callbacks. It has callbacks because we need to interoperate with Twisted. So when we're looking at the callback example using uh, the Tulip API, you can see that actually it's worse in some ways than the Twisted example because there is no callback chain. If you look at the main block, there's no callback chain. To understand the control flow, you have to like look at the end of each function because one function passes off control to the next function. You have to look at the okay. You have to look at the whole thing. So um, the callback API in Tulip is not very robust, robust compared to Twisted. I think that's probably on purpose. I think Guido does not want you to use callbacks. And then here again, we have we go back to Twisted because I'm insane. Uh, and here, this is actually an example where I'm using inline callbacks. Because in Twisted, it is possible to write some of your code using a 
callback list style. So here we have a download function that looks very similar, except we're, we're using yield instead of yield from. And it all looks kind of nice, right? It's like, I can sort of deal with this. It's like, I, I don't need to be a mystical ninja. I'm not going insane when I look at this download function. But then, you know, you scroll down a little bit and you look at get body and it's like, okay, I'm starting to go insane again. Right? Because you can't get rid of, you can't easily get rid of these, this data received and the connection loss callbacks because you need to override them on like a subclass. And I think what this sort of tells me is that callbacks are sort of intrinsic to Twisted. You can't, you can only sort of hide them, you can't get rid of them completely. And that's why we need something like Tulip. All right, so the Tulip API, I'm going to actually start getting into it. Um, it's mostly defined in PEP 3156. Um, one thing to note is that Tulip is not available in the Python package, in package index. You can't do pip install Tulip. Um, it has all the stuff that you would expect, kind of low-level sockets, file. It also has concurrency data structures, uh, which you think you, you might not need, and you technically don't, but they're still useful, right, to, to help you not... Um, you know, shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, also includes SSL and HTTP. The surprising thing is that it actually supports WebSockets, which uh, last time I checked, Twisted.web actually didn't support yet. Um, so I need to address the issue of coroutines versus tasks, because this was a thing that uh, really tripped me up when I first started working with Tulip. Uh, basically, you, you can just, if you look at something, and it, like a coroutine is something that needs to be executed by yield from. And then task is, is not. You don't need to use yield from. I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, so coroutine is actually a, basically a Python construct. It's not something that, uh, it's something that Tulip uses, but it's actually just part of Python. So it's a function that contains at least one yield from statement. But you don't want to confuse it with a generator function, because that's a function that contains a yield expression. And so uh, I'm not going to go into differences, but I would say that yield from is sort of more flexible than yield. Um, and actually, Tulip will only accept coroutines. It does not accept generator functions. It'll actually throw an error if you try to feed it a generator. Uh, so here's an example of a coroutine. Uh, you, you've basically already seen this before. That was in the previous example. Um, you have to call yield from because tulip.http.request, this function, it, it gives you a coroutine. But uh, the coroutine object is just an object. It doesn't execute any code. You have to call yield from on it for the body of the coroutine to actually be run. And then a task, uh, basically, it, it's a thing that wraps around the coroutine. But because it wraps around the coroutine, you don't need to call yield from on it. Uh, on it. it sort of handles it for you. And it's actually roughly equivalent to the deferred object from Twisted. And here, here's an example, one example possible way of using a task. So, Actually, if you look at the previous slide here, you see I had a tulip.coroutine decorator that sort of marks it as a coroutine. Here, I have the same function, but I use tulip.task. So this function is actually still a coroutine because, as, as I said, as long as it has yield from, it's still a coroutine. But now I'm decorating with a tulip.task, so it gets turned into like a task wrapper function. And then you don't need yield from to, to make it run. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to beat this into the ground. So like, this is also confusing. There's two types of, uh, there's a tulip.task and tulip.task with a capital T. The difference is, one is a decorator, and then the other one is a constructor that makes a task object. Um, I don't know, it, maybe I'm going a little insane, I don't know. All right, so why do you even need to use tasks? Because tasks are, are you know, associated with callbacks, and we want to avoid callbacks, right? Well, we still need them because we want to interoperate with Twisted. And then um, it's nice to use a task because it has a cancel method on it, so you can cancel like a coroutine that's running. And also, if you want to start a new coroutine from a, within a different coroutine, um, a task is one way of doing that. Um, yeah? Yeah, so the question is, can you set a timeout to cancel it if, it, if it's running too long, right? Yeah, you could use a task for that. Um, okay, so then there's the concept of the future. And I didn't actually want to talk about it because there's two features in the, the Python library. There's tool.future and there's concurrent.futures.future. And concurrent.futures.future is actually already in the standard library. It's already in 3.3. .3. 
Um, the difference is like one is for threads and one is for the event loop. Otherwise, they have a pretty similar API. Um, I don't know, you're probably going to get them confused anyway. Uh, so how does future connect with task? Well, future is a super class of tasks, so it has all the stuff. All the stuff that task has, it comes from future mostly, but the difference is that future doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with a coroutine. It's a little bit more abstract. You don't actually use features, but internally, um, internally Tulip uses them, and there's a lot of places in the API where, uh, where you actually need to use them. And actually, features always also are acceptable to yield from. So they're, they're sort of equivalent to coroutines, but they're not actual coroutines and blah, blah. Yeah, I hate this part. Uh, yeah, so there's some methods on future, yay. Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that most of you here are web developers, so you might be asking yourself, well, am I ever going to use this stuff? Like, is this good for web development? And I think, uh, yeah, basically because Tulip supports HTTP, so it gives you everything that you, you need, really. It's all in the tulip.http module, and then basically you need to subclass the server HTTP protocol class, and then override handle request. And here's a little example. Um, it's, it's mostly blur play. Uh, only part that's interesting is sort of in the middle where uh, we're making, we're generating our HTML, and then we're writing it to the response. And we have to call dot encode because it expects a byte array because it's Python 3. And yeah, if anything is like not clear, oh, Pete. Yeah, where were the coroutines? Like, where's the yield from? That is, that is actually a really good question. So I marked this as a coroutine, but the truth is that tool of that coroutine is just for show. Like, it does, it does jack. This is actually not a coroutine because there's no yield from in it. But like, it doesn't hurt if you, if you call yield from in a non-coroutine. Like, nothing bad happens. It just gives you the result of the function. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a big deal. Uh, but the like, tulip.coroutine is mostly just used to, to mark your functions as coroutine, so you know which ones you need to uh, execute by using yield from, which ones you can just call like a normal function, right? Uh, but in practice, like this is a very simple uh, you know, example. In practice, you'll probably will use yield from when you're writing like an actual web application. There'll be probably slightly better examples, maybe. Does that answer your question, Pete? Okay, yeah. yeah that's, that's all I aim for, sort of, yeah. Okay, so, so some observations. You might have noticed that it's kind of, uh, the API is a little low level. It's just like WSGI. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a web application by like, starting from raw WSGI, right? That, that would be insane. Uh, so there's probably going to be a lot of frameworks that are, that are going to sprout around Tulip. And then speaking of micro frameworks, hey, I made my own just for this talk. All right, so it's a very small one, and um, it's, it's not like you know, Django or Bottle or Flask or anything like that. It actually uses a different model because Tulip is a different thing. So after you do your initial page load, um, all the communication between the client server is handled through WebSockets. And, so it, it, and also, the reason I, I made it is because the code demos, like if you want to do concurrency demos and um, you show them in like, you know, the console, it's going to be like, so painful to watch because you're not going to... like understand what's going on at all, because it's just a bunch of text, right? So, so you have to you know, do it a little differently. So it's going to run uh, the visual part of the demo in the browser itself. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to give you a few demos and um, you know, live demos. What could go wrong, right? And actually, I think here may, might be a good place to uh, take a short break, and you can kind of um, <sighs> digest some of the things that I like, uh, dumped into your face. Oh yeah, sorry, question? Uh, it probably does, because Tornado use, uh, so the question was, it seems similar to Tornado, which actually that wasn't a question, but, but yeah, I think that's true, right, because Tornado uses yield, right, but it doesn't use yield from, as I understand. Right, so um, like I said, like the direction that we're going in with all this isn't new. I should have mentioned that in Python itself, we already have frameworks that, that do this callbackless model. The main difference I was, I was say, I think, between Tulip and Tornado is that Guido took extra care to make sure that the, um, the, the error tracebacks are a little better, and he, and he claims that yield from is part of what helps with that. But I haven't used Tornado, so I, I don't know if that's true. Another question? So under the syntax, which is clear, I'm not sure what yield from does. Okay. 
So like yield from basically executes the body of the coroutine. Because you, you understand, so the question was, what does yield from do, right? So in the coroutine, the coroutine by definition already has yield from. And inside of that yield from, it's, um, it's yielding stuff, just like a normal generator function. Um, oh, but okay, yeah. So yield from in the context of Tulip, though, it's returning control back to the, uh, the event loop. And the event loop uh, does like run some other coroutine for like one slice or something, and then hands it back to the original coroutine. So like yield from is a way of handing control, of having multiple entry and exit points to a function. Uh, does that make any sense, what I said? So what if you notice the yield from is like, he was trying to fetch a website, mm -hmm. you know? So that takes time, right? Because you're going to have to look through it and do it and so on. Well, when you, do, when you do that, which coroutine is the same as like, so I'm going to ask for this third party thing to happen, and then I want my process that I'm using to be used to do other things while I'm waiting for that response. So that's a, it goes back to the ability to do my process and other users' response. Or, you know, the request while it's waiting for that to come back. Sounds sort of cool. Yeah. 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 Have you, have you looked at Eventlet or Gevent and compared it to these things? Um, so the question is, have I looked at Eventlet and Gevent and compared it to this? So I didn't, but I watched the keynote from Guido, and he did, and he had some choice comments on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and you, and you, I'm totally against Guido on this. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm like, those of us who have been using Eventlet and Gevent, uh, like this whole thing is hilarious because we huh. saw Right. I gave a talk on it, um, but and I just I don't know. Uh, it's right. Okay. It's sort of something that has to resolve because we've been using it for a while and it's it's the best thing ever. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> for whatever reason, and I think it's just because everybody that uses it just kind of go, well, that's that's done, and we're done here. Uh, nobody's talking about it. I don't. I don't know why. Right. Um. Yeah, and I don't think I can say anything more. Like Guido's argument of, against Eventlet and Gevent was mostly like he didn't like the patching that was going on, yeah, and he didn't. It's hilarious because it's like, I mean, it's a, it's not a a problem with Gevent and Eventlet that they need to patch. It's a problem with Python that it needs to well, well, that it needs to get patched. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, let's not get into that because we'll like kill each other eventually. Maybe. So we could, we could do that some right, other we're day. We're going to take a quick break. We right, have yeah. one question. We have a Q&A after this. Yes. One more. Uh, I think that, so Tulip is, um, he might as well have called this library carrot because he wants to dangle the carrot for people to, uh, <laughs> right, to, to use Python 3 because the, the truth is people are, not enough people are using Python 3. So I think like, there are no plans at all to backport to 2.x. To, to yes? Okay, so who in the room is using Python 3? There's three. <laughs> Yay. You should all join our, our little club. All right, so, so here's what we're going to take. Before we take a quick break, I'm just going to, I've already... All right, ready to go. Save, save me, Jeebus. Okay. So um, I noticed a lot of people didn't come back. That's okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> whatever. I said it's just frosting. I mean, whatever. You don't like frosting. That's fine. Uh, so, uh, as we're going to head into the demo portion, uh, I just want to say that one thing I should have made a little more clear is that whenever you see yield from, that's an indication that there's some kind of uh, inbound I.O. happening. So like, um, for example, here, of course there's I.O. happening, like when you call response.write, obviously it's sending I.O. out to the client, right? But this response.write, it returns immediately, like it, it buffers it, it handles it internally, uh, you don't need to worry about it, but like when you see yield from, like um, you know, for example, when you were looking at uh, the download function, like when you see yield from here, that means like there's some I/O, there's some bits coming in, and 
you, you're saying this yield from, like, I'm going to wait for it to happen, even though I know it's not going to happen right away. Um, so maybe that makes it a little more clear. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yes. How is that different from yield in parentheses? Uh, yield in parentheses in 2 7? That's just the yield. No, I mean, there's, there's a. You were born in that David Beasley slide yeah. where he, yeah, he showed yield versus yield in parentheses. It's not so much in parentheses as that it can be an uh, expression instead of state. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into differences between yield and yield from, and, and yield with parentheses, I don't really, I don't think I totally understand, yeah, yeah. like my response is save me, Jeebus. All right. Okay, so first demo, uh, so we have an HTML file that we're serving up, so this is the initial page load, right, it's a very boring, you know, page, it's got a button of ID of go, it's got two p tags, one with foo, one with bar. It's got another p tag, p -tag that's going to act as our log. Okay, very simple. Uh, and then uh, demo.py. So I'm using that little you know framework I told you about. So when I say veal.connect here, and I give it a selector and an event name, what's saying is whenever the uh, on the client someone clicks the button with id of go, uh, a message is going to be sent to the server, and this particular function is going to handle that message. Um, so uh, the code for this is actually pretty simple in Tulip. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to bother showing it to you. I'm just trying to demonstrate some like very basic stuff. And then foo and bar are almost identical. It's just that the return value is different. One says foo is done, the other says bar is done. And then um, all they do is they make these so-called widgets, you know, and then they, they display them in the client. They add them to the client. And the client being obviously the browser, essentially. So here I'm going to run the demo, and oh no, that's fine. So the, there was no. What happened is it, it jumped before the web server could start. So like it, it's always going to do that. Um, that's actually, yeah, whatever. I messed up. Okay. So look, widgets are being made. And uh, it's yes, it, all the demos are going to be this durable. Um, and you can see, like, basically, uh, it's running serially, right? Foo, start, foo runs, right? Because yield from causes it to wait. Is this with WebSockets? Yes, with WebSockets. Yeah, so, like, um, all these widgets are being sent over the wire through WebSockets. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually put up VO on GitHub so you can look at it, how it's written. It's, it's still, like, not very big. Yeah, so that's, like, our baseline. So now we're going to look at the simultaneous version uh, again, yeah. So now they're going to run at the same time. So like you can get the same number of widgets in a shorter amount of time. Yay, right? Okay, so the code, the code is, is pretty similar. Uh, index didn't change at all. Here though, uh, so this got a little bigger. So I'm using the task API. And this is actually horrible. Like you should not do this. This is a complete anti-pattern. Um, but like this is the only way I could think of to do it when I first started using Tulip because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't, this is essentially polling, right? It's going in this endless loop and sleeping every one second to see if task one and task two are both done. And yeah, don't do this. Foo and bar are unchanged. So here we're going to actually, eh. This actually, I, I don't need to really run this. I mean, this is exactly the same thing. But here, um, well, this is not exactly the same thing because the widgets are actually random because sometimes they're cuter and sometimes they're not as cute. Right, but in demo.py, I think the code is cuter, right? So what we do is we, we make a sequence uh, or a list of coroutines, right? We make, we make a foo coroutine, a bar coroutine, and we pass them both uh, through the list into tulip.wait. And um, yeah, I'm not going to explain this tuple of done penning, but basically we go through like the, the so-called features, and then we just uh, log the result. And the result of a future is whatever is the return value in, uh, in these two coroutines. And, and so, yeah, this is the correct way to, to do it. And it's obviously a lot shorter, looks nicer. Uh, let's see, next demo. So now, uh, again, in, in the demo, question, yes? Where exactly does it block the way for the results? So. So where it blocks is actually, it blocks here. So yield from tulip.wait is where it blocks. So it waits for both of them to finish. And then you get the result back. 
And then what done is, is it's a list of the ones that were able to finish, and pending is a list of the coroutines that weren't finished for whatever reason, probably errors. Is that uh, another question? Uh, yeah. control is happening. Is there any way to, to see more sort of linear, you're going to write the linear way? That well, here, though, it's not like, it, you're not, it's a, yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. That's probably a, a problem with my demo itself. But there's no, um, whatever difficulty is coming, I, I think, is not from callbacks, at least. So that's good. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. It, you, you do have to, yeah, read the functions to see what's happening. but. I'm telling you right now that foo and bar, all they do is make widgets. Yeah, and we're, we're just looking at um, different ways of, different patterns of using the Tulip API to do different, uh, different concurrent things that you might do. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, sort of, at all? I think my concern is still... Okay, yeah. Well, then it's, it's just a concern. I can't... Yeah, sorry. Um, did I run this demo yet? No, right? Okay, so this one doesn't wait until both of them finish before it logs. So one of them is going to finish earlier, I think. Actually, maybe I'll just run it again. Ooh, look at all these widgets. Okay, yeah, so bar finished earlier this time, and then it printed, and then foo is going to finish later. Okay, uh, maybe that was clear. We'll see. Oh, why did I run it again? No. And here, it, it's a little bit more confusing. But uh, basically, I'm doing the same thing, except I'm using tulip.asCompleted. So this one doesn't actually block the whole time like .wait does. Um, this yield from waits for the first future that finishes and then prints out the result. And then foo and bar again. The, they're basically the same. Except one makes 12 widgets, the other one makes 8. So that I make sure one of them finishes first. Any questions about that one? All right. Um, basically, you're going to just watch widgets be made all night. <clears throat> so this one, uh, we bring in threads because we can't really completely get away from threads. Like a lot of code runs only in a thread. And remember, like most of the Python standard library is not written uh, off of Tulip, right? Because Tulip is not in the standard library. And so there's a lot of synchronous code that you're going to have to write still. And you're going to have to write down a thread if you you know, have a Tulip program. So this one uh, does the same thing. But what's happening is all the work that's happening in bar is happening in another thread. So it doesn't get to print it out until after it's generated all of its widgets. And let's take a little look at the code. So it, it looks a little different. Um, not in this part, not in the start function. But, um, and food is still the same, but bar is now a little bit different. So, oh, it's actually got a little too wide. Oh. Okay, so basically there is a function on the event loop object called run in executor. And I, I don't know why it's called that, but it has to do with like the concurrent module that, that we sort of mentioned a little bit. So if you pass in none, it just uses, sorry, question? Uh, yeah, I didn't mind the probably but so that, if I run executor, does that generate, does that acknowledge another Python process? It launches a, a thread pool. So I was going to... So then is it affected by the gel? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's, it's threads. Yeah. Right. Uh, so if I pass in none, which is mostly what you want to do, it just uses the, the default thread pool, which I think has five threads. I don't remember. I just read the pep, I guess. Uh, and then I pass in the function, which is a new function I made called bar synchronous. And this one makes widgets synchronously. It doesn't use yield from at all. Uh, and then it collects all the widgets and then, and then prints them to the client after the thread is finished running. So I mean, that's, like, that's fine to do. But if you can not do that when you're using Tulip, that would be great. Because, yeah, because threads, they suck, right? Anyway, uh, so this one is actually almost the same as the previous one, because uh, obviously they all make widgets. But this one actually has the thread talking back to the event loop thread. So here you see that it's happening at the same time. Uh, but there's a little bit of extra logging. So like all this logging that's happening is being initiated from the other thread. So if we look at the code, that will reflect that. So foo is still the same, start is still the same. Uh, here in bar, we changed it 
a little bit. So we're, we're passing in bar synchronous, but we're also passing in extra parameters of loop and client. And inside of bar synchronous, we make a call to the, the uh, event loop object, and we say call soon thread safe. And that's like the only thre thread safe function that's, that exists on the event loop object. And so like, we're communicating back with the thread. So what we're doing here is uh, we're appending another widget to the bar slot, and uh, we are also logging to the client, sort of from other thread. Yeah. And so will those run in the thread pool or in the main? Uh, when I call call soon thread safe, it's gonna it's gonna run in the event loop. So you're passing the yeah you're gonna pass in the function that you want it to run in the parameters, and then when the event loop has time for it. When it's done doing whatever else it's doing, it's going to run these two. Um, essentially, you're requesting it that it run a function with these parameters. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so these are, um, these are an attempt to show that you can still make something useful but beyond like making these widget demos. And uh, I'm not going to really go too much into this code, but this one is a, is a very simple regex debugging debugger, essentially. Uh, it might not be very big, but so what it does is it just passes messages in between. Um, oh, whoops, I didn't say street. So it'll like do it essentially in real time. And you'll see like at the left column, you see the, the what group uh, returns, what groups returns, etc. Um, and then I can make a little group here. Yeah, and see groups now returns Grim. Uh, make another group. You can add uh, a named group, whatever it's called. And so now group dict returns something. So I guess that's kind of useful, right? Um, if you look at the code, it's still, it's actually only a single function. Oh, because I cheated. I actually like, put in extra stuff in, in like a CoffeeScript file. So it's actually not that impressive. Um, but here, I made a chat application because you have to make a chat application when you're making web framework now. So you just you just suffer through my stupid chat application. Sorry. All right. So I'm gonna log into my chat. Ooh, Feihan. Right. Uh, and then to make sure that it actually works, I'm gonna start up another tab. Let's see. What is it? Eight thousand. Yeah. Um, Eagle Man. It's like, can I see it? Yeah, see? Oh, but, oh man, they're the same color. So it's supposed to be randomized, but somehow it got the same color. So dumb. <laughs> I, I spent all that time with the coloring. Oh, yeah, exactly. I won the lottery. Let's see. Uh, Right? I mean, what else is Eagle Man going to say to you? Right? Okay. Oops. All right, and so you can see that. Uh, oh, actually. And then, and I left the, the room because I don't, I don't want to hear Eagle Man sell me insurance. <coughs> um, yeah, so uh, this one is, is really short because all it does is essentially event handlers from the client. Um, and all this extra stuff in here is from like the coloring thing, which didn't even work because I got the same <laughs> exact colors. Um, but like without that, I think this is only like 30 lines because because all the the framework does is pass messages, and then that's all a chat application is. So so yeah, so you can make all types of chat applications with Tulip, yay. Uh, so uh, I guess that's it for uh, my demos. Uh, here are some useful links that you can click on later, assuming uh, I upload these uh, onto the web, which I think I will. Um, I should. <laughs> and then any more questions? Oh, yes? It, I mean, at the beginning of the talk, you went through a lot of efforts to show how um, like, like Tulip should replace Twisted, it seems, because Twisted is it, difficult to right, tell right. the order of the calls. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me, I mean, it's, uh, people have said a couple different mm -hmm. times that it seems that a lot of this is just personal preference because 
It's okay. It can be considered hard to tell what the order of the calls are. It's specific. You have to go through and do the same things you would have to do with the choice then, or control A or G minus or like that. You would have to look at the uh, so to sort of summarize the question, I think you're trying to, you're saying that, well, it's, it's mostly commentary, actually, I think. So like you're saying that um, at the beginning of my talk, I made some effort to, to make it seem as if uh, Tulip is simpler to use than Twisted, uh, but maybe it's just a point of preference, right? And actually, um, I, I can't say you're completely wrong, but I will like uh, go back to this particular example, and you can agree or disagree. But like the tulip version of what of the same thing, I thought was is way better. I don't say I'm not claiming that they're both awesome, but um, at least we get away from this uh, pattern of having to override like a protocol. Like, do you when you look at this like get body function, do you say I love this, or do you say barf? Like, like what is your reaction? Like, what is your natural reaction? Right. My my natural reaction is I I don't love this. This is something that only a mystical ninja would love, right? I don't know. Does that sort of address what I'm your your commentary? I mean, I, I don't know that the commentary would be addressed. I mean, it's just what right. I'm yeah. Saying is, I mean, you know, what I would say is when you look at typical typical uh, typical twisted code, typical uh, tornado code, typical tool code, obviously. Um, it, it doesn't look like this exactly. Um, yeah, that's true. You know. Yeah, I think it's still asynchronous programming. Still, just going to be hard, probably. Exactly. Like, and it's maybe full of is a step in the right direction. Maybe it's not. It's uh, it's definitely coming towards us. So uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, on that note, uh, part of what you were trying to say earlier was selling it was like so the trace bags and things like that are awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I was. Uh, maybe I sold that too strongly. We'll see. Um, I could. I could try. You know. Um, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to uh, run it with. Uh, but I, like, I. I suck at doing stuff. Like that's why I actually the ten. Right, right, that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, but I don't even have my editor open. Right, right, but you know what? That, I'm just going to screw it up even more. So I, I, can't, I can't win in this kind of situation. So yeah, so here I'll just be like, foo. All right, and then let's see if I can even find that file. Which one is it? It's two, right? <laughs> Well, hey, that's oh no, wait, sorry, I yeah, one over zero, yeah, one over zero. Oh, see, I I suck at this. Okay. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, because I'm I'm see I'm running it in Python two seven, so obviously obviously it's a syntax error, right? Uh, all right, here now now this is gonna work for sure. No, it probably won't. Let's see, is that? Even the right one. Let's see. Well, this is lovely, isn't it? Uh, I don't think I even got started. Yeah. Uh, this is why I don't do these things. Hold on. Actually, maybe I'll just try running it without the error. Yeah. Like I, I have no idea what just happened. Yeah. It's the live demo curse. I. This didn't even happen. I've run this before like a million times. Yeah. No, that's a good point though. Like, are the tracebacks really that much nicer? I don't know because yeah, I haven't done it. You don't have enough. internet. You're trying to connect to the web. Oh right, I don't have internet. Yeah, you know what? I give up. Sorry. <laughs> that's why. It's no, it's a good point though. Yeah. Wait, you said this is Python three four. It's going. To, yeah, it's going to be in Python three four. Traceback there is something along the lines of 3.3 of it. Right, because that's the current version of Python. Yep, 3.4 isn't landing until next year. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm going to introduce the 
error. And it's going to be amazing. Let's see. Um, download that by. Uh, yeah, you can't even see it though. Can you even see it? I don't know how to hold this up. Really? I mean, the stack's not as deep, but like, there's no policy. Right, it's, it's a super, super small there's example. The, the stack isn't as deep. Oh, I still don't know how to hold this up. There's still no call stack. Control plus. Ah, OK. Here you go. Yeah, I don't know if it's really that amazing. It's, it's such a small program, though. It's still not a, like, a good example. I don't have like a large enough program, I think. Yeah, because all the stuff up here, but... Probably not. Okay. Was there, yes. So do you have any thoughts on the whole room? Do you look like a carrot? You know, you should stay on 2.7 and do something else. Do you? What about things that don't quite work right? Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear part of your question. Yeah. Things that don't work right? What? Well, no. So, I mean, maybe this is good if you don't have dependencies on 2.7. Like, what if you have dependencies on that? And, and, what are your thoughts about moving forward versus sticking to the model? Uh, I mean, this is really like uh, whether or not you, you can move forward with Python 3 question, right? Well, I, mean, I think. Specifically because of, of this, or the whole kind of asynchronous problem within, within Python. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what your question is. There's some nice things about 2.7, libraries that work. Right, right. right. Do you think it's worth putting up with that in order to stay with those libraries or moving into well, I would, Python 3.4? So, so moving on yeah. to Python 3, I think um, answering your question in a very generic way, uh, I think the state of affairs is a lot better than it used to be. Um, it's still kind of painful, but I think that if you... Like my sort of dumb answer to this is if you're on Linux, which maybe you should be on Linux because it's cool. Uh, I think you have a lot fewer problems. If you're on Mac, um, maybe you should just give up. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really bad. Yeah. Right, because like, I, I tried to do pip install, twisted, I got C-Lang errors all over the place. It works fine, 2 to 7, so like, why should I move the 3 if I'm using twisted? But I've been on Linux, it's like, it works just fine, no problems at all. Or, you know, or maybe the answer is use Vagrant, use a virtual machine, uh, I think the, the three situation on certain platforms is bad. On other ones, it's not as bad. It's kind of a weird platform-specific thing, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So I have a dumb question. Mm -hmm. so I don't basically good program at all. I don't know. I don't really work with Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there common cases where programmers should be using this sort of programming paradigm or they're not? Yeah, so for asynchronous programming, um, definitely for like certain kinds of network programming, it's probably a good idea. Also, if you're, um, all these demos are technically just um, GUI demos, right? I'm connecting with a front end and then there's a back end that they're exchanging messages between them. But in general, any kind of, um, any kind of you know, visual programming needs to be event-based. So that's another example of where you need asynchronous programming. Sorry, question for one yeah. Mm -hmm. So, is like Go? Yeah. How does this relate to there's a, there's a Go guy who did the, the Go guys. He's here or did he, did he like die already? I died. Okay, he's dead. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about Go to answer that question. Closure recently is the four Right, and I haven't looked at Closure. But I think Closure, doesn't it use like the agent thing or, or is that Scala? Yeah, that's Scala, yeah. Objects, which is really awesome. So yeah, you can. It's way easier to do asynchronous stuff because uh, you can work on the same objects and not have to worry about affecting them badly. And yeah, why don't, we, why don't we just mention Erlang while we're at it? Yeah. Like Haskell, Monads, right? I'm sure you can do something amazing with them, right? Yeah, or that. Uh, oh yes. How does uh, Scuba compare with uh, sorry, for cars with 
Oh, like, how does uh, Tool compare compared to Twisted for in terms of performance? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna guess it's worse right now, just because it's so new, and and it's like you know, um, like I don't want to dump on other people's work, but like in Python, when Python three first came out, like streams were kind of bad, right? People were complaining about that. It's it's really new. Like I I don't think you can compare it directly until like Tool actually sort of matures. So, yeah, I don't know. Yes? Uh, so if somebody writes some really wacky protocol parsing code in Twisted for some random protocol, will mm -hmm. I be able to use, take advantage of that? And yeah, so Guido, Guido said, so the question is, will you be able to take advantage of, like, ran, of you know, wacky protocol code that's written in Twisted? Will you be able to use it in Tulip? Um, Guido said explicitly in his keynote that if, if he doesn't have like, good interoperability with um, Twisted and Tornado, et cetera, that essentially the, the project has failed. So uh, assuming he doesn't fail, you should be able to do that. It's a very optimistic answer. <laughs> yeah. All right, are there any more questions? All right, thank you.